Okay. What uh, this class is called Chassidus. Now, Chassidus is what makes every Chassid want to become a Chassid, right? He's called a Chassid because he learns Chassidus. What is Chassidus? To me, it's the ultimate. It's, and the, by definition, it is the ultimate. And I'll tell you what it is. What happened was, during the time, every generation has its, um, the, the Talmud says every generation has its own special mission. So the first generation, which is the generation in the desert, which we're learning about in the Parsha, they're called the Dordea. The, genera- the Gemara calls them the Dordea, the generation that knows. In other words, they know God. And their job is to get to know God, lay the, fa- the groundwork for all of the generations to come and how to approach God, what's the proper way to perform mitzvahs, how to do, learn Torah. They live in the existential state of godliness. They see godliness at all times. And um, they're called the door dea. Now, some other door means generation, and dea means to know. Now, other generations, says the Gemara, are door mysterious nefesh. Their job is to be live in a, in a perpetual state of self-sacrifice. Um, sac- self sacrifice for God. And I, it doesn't go into detail who, what everyone's generation is. But at some point, things have changed drastically. The, the Gemara says the time before the arrival of Mashiach is called Ikvisa de Mashiach, the heel of Mashiach. The heel, H E E L. What is the heel on the body? The heel is the least sensitive part of the body. It's the bottom of the body. So therefore, godliness is the most concealed, the least sensitive generation to godliness. Um, And the one that feels God the least. And we see that in the the times of the 1600s, that, um, and most of the, the Jewish world accepts this, meaning the from religious Orthodox world that uh, the, the Jew, it's described that the Jews were in a state of his alphos, which means fainting. The Jewish state of the Jewish people was in a state of faint, that they were, when a person faints, he's like in and out of consciousness. In other words, he's really not in touch with his soul. He really, does, he really has no idea what's going on. Um, so Yisrael Baal Shem Tev, that was his name, the, the, the Baal Shem Tev who lived in the times of just after the times of 1649, 1648, lives in that period, in the town of Akop in Ukraine. He introduced what the, gener- the generation's um, mission is. What's the, what's the mission of the generations? He recognized that we're holding by the ikvas of the Mashiach, that we're the times of Mashiach, uh, the heels of Mashiach. The Mashiach is, on his, is soon to arrive. And it's time to reveal something that has never been revealed before. So everyone speaks about Kabbalah now, like Kabbalah is no big deal. But what you have to understand is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who was the rabbi who wrote down the Zohar, the fund- fundamental work of, of, of Kabbalah, didn't teach that book publicly. You couldn't just walk into his academy and learn the Zohar. It was passed on to sage, from sage to sage. And it was in a hush-hush tone, because people felt like it would be misused or misunderstood. So for thousands of generations, it was kept secret. Now, there were, there were called mikubalim, people who understood Kabbalah, called mikubalim. Um, a very famous mikubal is the Arizal. If you ever go to Israel, especially the city of Tzfat, which is a very holy city, the, the doors are all blue. It's a very Kabbalistic uh, keeps away certain uh, types of bad spirits, for lack of a better word. Um, he began to teach the Zohar a little bit more freely. He, was, he received it. Now, everybody studies the Zohar. I mean, yeah, the Zohar, and everybody accepts the Arizal. That's his name, the Arizal. Um, and he began to teach it a little bit more freely and open, and his student, Rabbi Chaim Vital, wrote it down, his teachings. Rabbi, uh, the Arizal actually died at the age of, I believe, 36, didn't live very long. So he began to open up the channels. 
Then came Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, for lack of uh, other things that happened in between them. Yisrael Baal Shem Tov came and he saw that it's time to start really revealing this on a whole new level. And the Gemara says that if a person is in a state of faint, you, you whisper their name. If you whisper their name, like we spoke about yesterday, the, the name is external, but it's also connected to the essence of the person, right? It, it encompasses the entire person. So it says if you whisper their name, it wakes up their essence, so to speak. Jews are called Yisrael, B'nai Yisrael, children of Israel. Who was Israel? Israel was Jacob. We're all children of, of all the Jews are children of Jacob. Yisrael, by, the, by his very being, entering into this world, he, um, he is called by the name Yisrael, which is what the name of the Jewish people are. And it's, so to speak, awoke, woke, awoke the Jewish people. And what he began to do was disseminate these secrets of the Torah. More than that, it's the essence of the Torah. Now, some of it is very hard to understand, and it's incomplete until Mashiach comes. But there's a famous story about what exactly Hasidus is, and why it wasn't revealed, and what it's supposed to do. One day there was a king, and he had a son, the prince, who got very sick. And all the doctors in the world came to try to heal this prince. And nobody was able to find a cure. And the son, the prince rapidly was rapidly deteriorated to a state of, to a point of that there was, everyone had given up hope. Then a doctor comes and he said, I have the solution for this, for your son. But it requires one type of stone, and that stone needs to be crushed. And that stone is found in the king's crown. And it's not just found in the king's crown, it is the epicenter of the king's crown. It is the glory of the king's crown, and by extension, it is the glory of the king. It what sets him apart from every other human being. And without a doubt, the king right away took out the stone, he crushed it, and he made it into a, into a, uh, a medicine. But the doctor said, because the prince is unconscious, he's, he's fainting in and out, I'm not sure he'll be able to swallow anything. And the king said, what choice do I have? Hopefully at least one drop will fall in. That's all he needs is one drop. Hopefully one drop will fall in. And they poured it in and one drop came and it revived the sun until eventually he became whole and complete once again. The reason why this essence of Hasid, the essence of Torah, Hasidus in particular, was not revealed up until the last few hundred years is because the Mikubalim, those who received the, the tradition, who understood all these, understood that kind of Torah, that level of knowledge, felt that it would just be wasted. It would just fall. People wouldn't be able to appreciate it. And it would just fall to the end. Said the Baal Shem Tev came, Yisrael Baal Shem Tev came and said, we're at a point where we have no choice. That hopefully one drop will fall in, and that'll be enough to revive the Jewish people. And we see what has happened in the world since then. Uh, you know, I must say that uh, the, you know there's a certain revival of the Jewish people, and, and, and there's a certain revival. I think in a there's a spiritual revival going on in the world um, that you can find reasons why people. You know, you you could say, what do you mean? People are becoming less and less godly. But the argument can be made that people are becoming more and more spiritual. They're yearning for that depth. They're yearning for something. They're searching for something. So what we're going to do is we'll learn. I'm not going to teach more about what Hasidus is. I'd rather just jump right in. As I always say, if you ever want to watch a movie, right? Whenever they show uh, previews of a movie, they, they don't just start from the beginning of the movie. The beginning of the movie can be very slow. They go right into it, right into the middle. And uh, you see all the action. And then you watch it from the beginning. So I want to jump right in. And we'll learn a little bit. Now, this is the very first um, Hasidic discourse that I had ever learned, and it's called Mayim Rabin. 
And I feel like it's fitting because it has to do with um, financial difficulties. And it's connected to the Parsha of Noah, of Noah, the big, the great flood. And what that means on a Hasidic level. What does the flood mean on a Hasidic level? What does the ark, the, the teva, the ark, the boat that he went into, what does that mean on a Hasidic level? And what does that mean practically? Some would say that Hasidus is nothing more than the practical application of Kabbalah. Uh, it's deeper than that. The reason why it can be practically ap- a, a practical, it's, it's, it's not there to serve Kabbalah. It's the depth of Kabbalah and what Kabbalah, right, as I always say, Torah means to teach. You don't learn, you don't just learn Kabbalah for the sake of Kabbalah. You learn Kabbalah to apply it in life. And how do you apply Kabbalah? Well, really, that's what Hasidus, Hasidus comes, that's what Hasidus does. Hasidus is able to up, up, basically apply Kabbalah. It's not there to serve Kabbalah. It uses Kabbalah and tells you how to, just like it uses all the other levels of Torah, and to practically apply it. Um, sorry, excuse me, I'm not sure why. Okay, what I want to do is I'm going to share my screen. I don't know other, any other way. I wanted to send you the handout, but I didn't. Uh, I couldn't figure out how to attach anything. So I'm just going to share my screen over here, and we're going to jump right in. So you'll just watch me. We'll just read. Oh, share screen. Dun, 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 dun. All right, now you guys see what I see. Um, where is it? It's not here. Here we go. Okay, sorry, it's not perfect. Now, this Hasidic discourse was said by the Lubavitcher Rebbe in 1977 from his room. He had a heart attack on uh, Simchas Torah on one of the holidays, and he was in his room. And it was Motzei Shabbos, Parshas Parsh Noah. Motzei Shabbos meaning Shabbos had went out, Shabbos is over. And he went into his room, he was in his room, and they set up a hookup, and he said this Hasidic discourse from his room. Now, we can't just make up Hasidic discourses called Ma'amarim. You, you, that's what a Rebbe does. That's what a leader of a generation does, the Nasi, which is a leader. We can't just make that stuff up. Um, but we, we won't get into too much detail about that right now. Let's just go right into it. And this is what it says. It says in Shira Shirim, in the Song of Songs by King David. In Hebrew, it says, It says, The many waters cannot extinguish the love, and rivers cannot wash it away. In other words, Rashi explains that neither the mighty nations nor their leaders will ever succeed in washing away Israel's burning love for God. In other words, when a person is involved in uh, worries, that's when he begins to, uh, his love for God begins to wane. Yeah, when, when you're in a relationship and it gets a little bit rocky, you feel a little bit insecure, and you, your love for the other person begins to wane. As they would say, when people would come on the boat into America, yeah, the, they would say the boat, gets, the boat felt a little rocky as they were pulling into Ellis Island you know, near the Statue of Liberty. And what did the, people are like, oh, we have to make the boat lighter. And what was the first thing they would do is they would throw in their um, mitzvahs, like tefillin, yarmulke, you know, as if to make that lighter. It's a joke, but uh, in other words, when things get a little bit rocky and a little bit tough, the first things usually to go are your belief in God and whatnot. But here it says that with the Jewish people, it cannot be extinguished. So let's keep, let's, let's look inside. Many waters. What does it mean, Maim Rabin? So explains our masters and their discourses. It refers to all financial concerns and material worries that vex man. And still, nevertheless, these concerns cannot extinguish the love of God buried, buried within every Jewish soul. So um, as we explained before, that a soul is, is, is connected to God. Um, it's an extension of God. And therefore... Nothing can actually hinder that, uh, that connection. Pretty straightforward. Let's just keep going. To explain the term used by the masters, what does it mean financial concerns? Scripture states, when you eat of the labor of your hands, you are praiseworthy, and it, it is well with you. This means that the toil of earning a living should only involve one's hands and not one's mind and heart. Surely one must work to create a vessel for the divine blessing of livelihood, since the divine flow of energy is drawn 
into this world exclusively through the garb of nature. As it is said, and I'll show you, so God will bless you in all that you do. I'll show you the next page. God only blesses you. God only blesses you as long as you work. And this is a very famous line. We're not here to be, uh, to do nothing. Oh, sorry, everybody. How do I find the next page over here? <laughs> um, sorry. Let's see, is it right here? No, got a lot of things open. Sorry. All right, guys, we'll, I'll find a better way to do all this. Uh, no. All right. Nice, nice headshot picture. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, a good, I'm a good looking guy. What can I tell you? Okay, God will bless you in all that you do. So what does that mean? That means the only way you cannot just sit on your hands and uh, God will provide for you. That's not how God set up the world. That's not what God wants. So there's a famous question. Is a doctor allowed to operate? Isn't by being a doctor saying that God cannot heal you? Like, And there are people in this world that will say, I will not bring my son or daughter to a doctor because... I believe in God and I trust in God and God will, if God decides to take this person, take this person. If not, not decides to heal this person, heal this person. If not, not says the Torah. No, everything has to be done through nature. God will bless you in all that you do. You have to do now the blessing for there to be success. That comes from God. All we do is make a vessel. Now I always talk about vessels and light that that is a fundamental concept in Kabbalah and Hasidus. We're here to make vessels, and God will provide the light. So how much money you're going to make is not dependent upon you, but you have to make a vessel for the blessing. That's why every time a person, they, there's a famous saying, God fulfills every blessing that you make. Okay, well, I've said many things. Uh, God blessed me with a lot of money. God blessed me with uh, such and such a thing, whatever, and it didn't actually happen. Why didn't it happen? Well, either the famous joke is God just said, um, God responded and he just said, no, <laughs> it's like a classic, <laughs> the classic joke, but the, but in, in other words, but no, nevertheless, God does, ref, God does provide it, but it doesn't, you didn't make a proper vessel. The vessel itself is not, is not fitting for the blessing to come down yet, but it nevertheless, God is pouring um, blessings down at all times. We just have to be in a state to receive it. So God will bless you in all that you do. God wants everything done through nature. God wants you to put in the effort and then you will receive the reward. That's classic fundamental Torah concept. So in fact, be, and going back inside, because of the tremendous concealment of nature, man may even be required to toil profusely to obtain an income. That's what it says in the sages. Nonetheless, man should only employ his most external abilities in his labor his hands and other external limbs, but not his higher, more internal faculties, those of his mind and heart. Because what we said before was, um, what did it say? God, you should eat of the work of your hands, but not of your mind. In other words, your mind should be solely given over to God. And it's going to explain what that means. What are you like? If I have to uh, dig a hole and think about God, I'm going to be, my hole is not going to be very good. So what does that mean? Ultimately, it's going to say is that your kavana, your intention has to be to serve God. I'm here only to serve God. And everything that happens in my life is a result of God trying to give me blessing. But let's just read it inside. Indeed, these faculties must be designated solely toward the service of God, the why and wherefore of man's creation. In truth, man is required to utilize his intellect and his work. Since the divine flow of energy is concealed and obscured, within the garments of nature. However, he should do so only to the extent necessary for his work. He should not use his mind as a tool in devising schemes and developing strategies merely to attain greater and greater wealth. We're not here. There's nothing wrong with becoming rich and wealthy. There's nothing wrong with that. But that is not a goal in and of itself. I'm sure we all appreciate that. If you're here in this class, I'm sure you appreciate that uh, you're spiritually sensitive. You're a spiritually sensitive person. That money, although we need it and we'd like to have a lot of it, it's not our goal, end goal in life. 
And that's the right thing because money is nothing more than a tool to be used. We're here to serve God. And God is the one that provides for us. So to, to sit your whole life and figure out how to make more money and more money, you're not using out your mission. That's not your, your mission in life is to serve God, not to make money. Not, God will provide what you do and you need to work in order to get it. But that's not the end goal. So in fact, investing, moving on, investing one's mind and heart into one's labor is futile. This is a pretty extreme statement. Huh? Since God's blessing is what enriches. That's a quote. Whereas one's occupation is only a garment to contain this blessing. Not, the, not that one's job actually creates wealth, God forbid. So delving excessively into the garment of one's occupation is akin to wearing excessive clothing, which does not provide benefit, but on the contrary, does greater harm. Now, creating what happens is like this. We, what we're saying is you create a vessel, a garment for the blessing to come in. Now, your job is to make sure it's a proper garment, not to create many, many garments. Yeah, if a person starts putting out what it's saying over here is a person creates too many garments, too many vessels, it's going to become very heavy. It's going to weigh you down. And that you, you might even get the blessing, but you're going to be carrying this whole other load in and of itself. And, and, and I, think we, I think we see that. People who are obsessed with certain things, their image or money, it weighs them down. It becomes now I have to keep up this image or I have to continue this wealth because my whole self-worth is tied into this. I think my whole self-worth is tied into how much money is in my bank account or how much or how, my, how I look on screen. And if, any way, if that becomes diminished in any way, then I'm worthless. Says the Torah, you fool. <laughs> That's not where worth comes from. And all you're you're, you're putting that upon yourself and you're, you're bringing yourself more anxiety and more stress over nothing, over no benefit whatsoever, over a futile benefit. Does anybody have any, any questions? So this, this is delving deeper into, and it seems very simple, right? But this is actually, this is novel. The, people, the sages of our generation didn't, didn't read things like this. In other words, we're, we're looking at one passage. It says, Mayim Rabim, the, 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 the waters of financial stress cannot wash away the love of God. That's what King Solomon says. And they really didn't delve much into it. That was like the, the depth of the explanation, except for some people. This is actually looking deeper into what does that even mean? And we're going to look, we're going to take apart the words of the actual um, passage. And you're going to see what uh, you'll see it more in a depth. This is, I guess, this is more of an introduction. Does anybody have any questions? I mean, it's pretty straightforward, I guess. Let me get the other page ready. So this then is what is intended by interpreting the many waters of financial stress. All right, let me get that other page open here. Sorry, everybody. Um, where is it? Uh, let's try this one. Yep. Financial concerns. The many worries of financial concerns. Although one may be of such low spiritual stature that he's overwhelmed by his material affairs and is concerned for his livelihood, indicating that he has yet to internalize the axiom that God's blessing is what enriches, nonetheless, even concerns such as these cannot extinguish, God forbid, the love of God that exists within every Jew. Now, let's, we're moving on. The idea that many waters cannot extinguish the love becomes novel Considering that these many waters, the Mayim Rabim, financial concerns, originate in the realm of Tohu. Remember we spoke about Tohu and Tikkun yesterday? So now I, I, I thought this would be good. This will uh, give you a little bit of introduction of what Tohu is. Which supersede, superseded the realm of Tikkun. And I want to just uh, read a footnote over here, which you don't really see. But I think it's going to explain what Tohu is. And I'm curious how they... Um, how they actually, uh, how they do it. Okay, so uh, this is outside. I'm just going to read this to you outside. Creation is conceived in Kabbalah and Hasidus in terms of Giloy or Ein Saif, revelation of the infinite light. Together with such metaphor of the metaphor of light is inseparable that of Kalim. Okay, so let me, this is what I explained to you yesterday. I'm not going to go into it. 
Remember, when God created the world, he created this tremendous amount of revelation, this, this tremendous revelation that it, that it exploded the vessels which it contained. Now, we need vessels. What do we need vessels for? We need vessels so that we'd be able to appreciate something. So let me give you an example. As I said before, when Albert Einstein wants to explain the theory of relativity to a child, he cannot just say the theory of relativity the way he understands it. I know I always talk about Albert Einstein and the theory of relativity. I don't know why. But it, he cannot explain the theory of relativity the way he understands it. If he tries to explain it to you, everything he said is just going to fall to the wayside. You, it, basically, it's going to break your vessel, so to speak. It cannot be contained within the kid or myself, really. It cannot be contained within the kid. The kid doesn't have the intellectual capacity. It's not a proper vessel to receive that understanding. However, if the child begins to, as the child develops and understands physics more and more, his, he becomes more of a proper vessel to understand the language and the theory behind what Albert Einstein understands, right? It becomes more of a good, it becomes a more of a proper vessel. When God created the world originally, he created, he revealed himself as he is himself. This infinite essential being it, it left no room for anything for any created being to appreciate it if god reveals his, his entire essence we become nullified we see that there's nothing else but god right that's the that's the essence of god enoid milvado that there's nothing else besides god so if god were to reveal that we would cease to exist That, I, I think you should write that down because that's something that Jews meditate on. That really, there's this concept of enoid movado. There's nothing else besides God. And which obvious question is, what do you mean? I'm standing here, right? I think we spoke about this before. God created the world, yet there is nothing else beside him. They're both true. When God reveal, if God were to reveal his essence, we would cease to exist because we would now know that there's nothing else but God. We don't really exist. And hence my story yesterday. The, the chassid, the older chassid and the younger chassid were walking and they, they said, what do you think about all day? He goes, I think about myself. How can you think? Because he's thinking about, do I really exist? The Pasik, the Torah says, Enod Mavada, there's nothing else besides God. Now, anyway, when God first created the world, that was revealed. So therefore, there was no vessel to contain that. And therefore, the vessel that he did try to create exploded. And uh, those, the, the, those shards of vessels uh, sprinkled into the world. Then God created the world and the world of Tikkun, which means Albert Einstein, the way he, explain, he can explain the theory of relativity to the child. He's going to leave behind a tremendous amount of the theory of relativity. He's going to get rid of a lot of terminology. He's going to start explaining it in apples and oranges. It's, be, it's going to become more and more concealed. The, the kernel of like what the main theory of relativity is about is going to be very concealed because the child can't, right? The child needs all those concealments um, to appreciate. So Albert Einstein needs to, to say it in terms of apples and oranges and one plus one is two and two plus two is three. So the child would like have a, he needs to understand it through metaphors, a lot of metaphors. But the essence of the theory will be will be concealed. That is, Bella. Can I ask something or say something rather? I just want to add to that. I love that because I don't think, well, for me, I don't think you would want to be a part of or lift up or exalt a God that's anything less than something that cannot be reduced or, yeah. you know, if we can explain it or contain it in a vessel, then how do you say, okay, this is... Yeah. Oh, you're saying something else. The, mis the, I love the, the mystery will be gone. Is that what you're saying? I feel like. Um, no, no, I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying this is, that's amazing. Yeah, no, it's an unbelievable God, concept. Oh, yeah. God oh, is yeah. so big that we can't literally grasp it. You know, yes. We can yeah. only try to interpret it or, yeah. The world is a metaphor for God is what I was going to go into. The, everything in this world, it says the world is a bunch of metaphors. If you, you can, God's essence is here. What, but it's all concealed. It's all concealed with these garments and everything. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a metaphor after a metaphor after a, a metaphor. And the best metaphor for God is the human being. That's why the Torah says, we, let's make God, let's make man in our image. If, 
and, and King, King David says, Mipsari exa elika. From my flesh, I can perceive God. What does that mean? Mipsari exa elika. From my flesh, I can perceive God. Because it says God, man is a miniature God, so to speak. He's a metaphor for how God is. A metaphor. He's not God, but he's a metaphor. Meaning, I have intellect. I have emotions. Um, I have desires. These levels of desires and wills. Um, and uh, this, uh, this yearning to connect. But even more than that, even the flesh alone, like we very famous is like, you have fingers. Why do you have five fingers? Well, it's the, the fingers. Uh, no, why do you have four fingers over here? It's the letter Yod, the letter He, the letter Vav, and the letter He. Um, no, sorry, the letter Yod, the letter He, Vav, and He, which is the four letter name of, four letter name of God. There's, there are things that you look at in your life and they should, they, you can perceive, you can learn to perceive God by looking at them. Whatever. Chassidus is full of that. By you understanding yourself objectively, you can understand how God interacts with the world. Now, the same applies to everything else in this world. Grass, trees. You, and that's what Kabbalah and Chassidus comes to do. It comes to teach you how to look at it properly because it's nothing more than a metaphor. Now, going back, that's the world of Tikkun. The world of Tikkun, which means to uh, fix, has lots of vessels. And it's there so that we'd be able to appreciate God. We're like a child to try to appreciate, because we can't appreciate God the way God is. But what happens is, Masak and Olam, the whole goal is now, what Chassidus is coming to reveal is, how, the, how all of these vessels are merely expressions, are metaphors of God. And you can, you'll see how God really never left. Um, and how God is here. And God's essence is here. It's just covered over. So we're piercing through the layers. We're moving through the layers. Um, Another example that it, that Hasidus very often gives is the a, a ray of the sun compared to the sun. A ray of the sun is nothing, or a drop of the ocean compared to the ocean. But a ray of the sun, let's go to the ray of the sun. The is the is a ray of the sun not what we see is a ray. We don't see the sun. But it is an extension of the sun. It is nothing more than an extension of the sun. The whole entire essence of the sun is found within the ray. Now, if that ray goes through um, a colored window, does that change the sun in any way? It doesn't change the sun in any way. It just, it just changes the way we perceive the sun. But the sun itself remains, is not changed. It's, it remains the same as it was before. That's what happens. The, the, all these four worlds that we speak about in Kabbalah and Hasidus, it's God's essence going through um, more and more vessels. And the... Oh, but, it's all about the percent, but who, who does it change for? It changes for the one receiving the revelation. It's about the, their perception. God looks down and he sees no change. We're the ones that see the change. If Albert Einstein were to give, um, explain the theory of relativity to a, a seven-year-old child properly, he'll see in his metaphor that he gives to the child to explain the theory, how everything, a perfect metaphor would have there would be nothing missing from the metaphor. Albert Einstein can look at the metaphor and see the entire theory of relativity, so to speak. He just explained it in a, in a different vessel, but the entire theory is there if he was really good at it. Um, you know, just like when we want to explain two plus two is four. Now, two plus two equals four is a more spiritual concept than holding two apples and two oranges and putting them together, right? Two plus two equals four is only in our brain. Right? We don't, you can't touch two plus two equals four, but you can give a metaphor for it. I'll bring two apples and two oranges and put them together, and uh, I'll appreciate two plus two is four, right? But you, you basically materialize the concept of two plus two equals four into apples and oranges. So when you look at apples and oranges, you see the concept of two plus two equals four. You, you, can, you can appreciate, you, nothing is lost. It's all there. Now, the child still might not imagine two plus two equals four, and he thinks it of as, as apples and oranges. And hopefully, eventually, he'll understand that it's really just an intellectual concept, right? That's maybe I lost you a little bit. But does that does that make any sense? I don't know if anybody made that. Oh, let me see. Let me I'm what? So, okay, I'm sorry. Maybe that last like apples and oranges. <laughs> apples and oranges. Okay, I apologize. Uh, wait, am I supposed to be letting somebody in here? It's a little bit too late. Um, okay. 
I don't want to move any further. I think I'm going to stop right there. But I think there is more than enough to meditate upon in Chassidus. And we're just scratching the surface that... Um, um, can I yeah. ask, please? Yes. Please. Can we go back just a second? You oh. said, um, yeah. I guess you understood, explained a little bit about tikkun. Yeah. What was the other word? Tohu. Tohu, yes. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, tohu. So tohu is when God, when God first created the world, he created, um, he created his essence, so to speak. He created it. He just, he revealed his essence. He created the, the world. He created the world and then revealed his essence. Well, then everything shattered. There was no, the world wasn't a vessel to receive that yet. It's like, the, it's like Einstein explaining the theory to a seven-year-old the way Einstein understands it. The child's not going to understand anything. It's just, the child will just sit there and like, ah, oh, and have no idea what you're saying and no idea what you're looking at, so to speak. So the, mm -hmm. so the same thing, when God created the world, it's a little bit different, but when God created the world, what was revealed? The truth. The real absolute truth. And what's the absolute truth? That there's nothing else besides God. Eight, there's nothing else besides God. That God is the only true existence. So by definition, everything, so to speak, became nullified. Because everybody saw the truth of where they come from. The, the truth of what they are. That they're really nothing more than an extension of God. But, what, but in a certain sense, what ended up happening... I guess I'm getting a little confusing, but what ended up happening was the vessel, the, the, the vessel broke, so to speak, the vessel to appreciate that there's nothing else besides God shattered. It's, it's a spiritual shattering. It's spiritually shattered, but God left those, uh, um, that sh those shatterings, those remnants um, in the next world that he created, which is the world of Tikkun. It was all by design. God did this on purpose. The, the, that, um, those shards are left in our world. God then created a new world called Tikkun, which is many, many metaphors, right? Again, this idea of many, many metaphors. So, so that we, uh, we don't see God's essence. In fact, we see concealment. It's the opposite. We see a lot of concealment, but really they're concealments in metaphors. It, God just created one metaphor after another metaphor. Yeah. He, you wanted to take a very lofty concept such as God's essence, and you wanted us to be able to appreciate it. You need to you need to hide it. You need to um, say it in better say it in better words, words that will be easier for us to grasp and appreciate and understand, um, right? And like Albert Einstein, if he wants to explain the theory, he has to explain it in much easier terms. He's probably going to use more words, and he's going to draw pictures, and he's going to uh, you're going to move it move you're move, moving further and further away from the way Albert Einstein understands it himself. Um, and so therefore you're going to be more and more metaphors, more and more metaphors, more and more concealments. You're moving further and further away. That's the world of Tikkun. But what's cool is God left the, um, that shattered glass, so to speak, that shattering of his essence. He left it here in this world that we can find it and we collect it. Those kernels of truth in everything that we, that we were talking about, there's like kernels of truth in everything. We're there to collect it and, and make it and fan it and make it brighter. So that's called when Tohu and Tikkun will be reunited once again. That we'll understand Albert Einstein's theory the way he understands it. We'll appreciate God's essence. We'll appreciate God the way he understands himself. And yet we'll still be able to remain human beings, like without becoming nullified. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Just, well, but by the way. It's we're, a good explanation, actually. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Every week we're going to learn more and more about that, and it'll become more and more clear as time goes. It's a wild concept. I mean, it's like, it's like, there's so many layers. <laughs> very a lot of layers, and and this is by the way, the goal is to meditate. You meditate upon what is meditation in Judaism. You think about it and you apply it to your life, and you you just constantly think about it and you reconstruct it in your mind, and your your world will change. The way you start looking at everything begins to change. Um, problems are not problems anymore. I mean, if you're, I'm not saying I'm perfect and I don't have my moments. I have an animal soul. You know, I have a part of me that's like, the animal soul is like, okay, like you're moving, this is like too lofty. You're not understanding what you're saying. Get me a pizza. I mean, I believe me, you, that you'll have moments like that. <laughs> I have moments like that all the time. But nevertheless, it, it lifts a person up. Chassidus will lift you up above, above issues and problems 
Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, okay. Go ahead. I, I, you'll get the audio, and you guys can listen, listen to it again. But we'll. This is what we're going to talk about every week until it becomes ingrained in your mind, <laughs> and my mind as well, by the way. <laughs> you know. Okay. Okay, everybody. With that, I'm going to stop here. Um, we'll move further in the in the in the in the mimer. What's called the Hasidic discourse. It's called the mimer, and uh, more and more concepts will will come out, and we'll learn more and more concepts. Okay. Be well, everybody. Thank Again, you. Yeah, no Thank class you. tonight. There's no class tonight. No class tonight. Okay. Be well. Thank you. No problem. Bye. How do I stop?